well as the um, administrator of it. And I'd like to welcome you all to our panel, Striving to Save a Religious Identity from Extremists. What I will briefly go through is essentially what heathenry is, some of the symbolic representations of heathenry, and the ways in which extremism began and progressed in our faith to the present day. And finally, the way in which we are combating it. We will then open, uh, we will open our panel for after that to discussion and answer any questions that you may have that I kindly request to be saved um, for, saved for that time. Uh, on our panel, we have um, Robert Schreiber. He is the co-manager of Heathens Against Hate and the president of the Troth and Inreach uh, prison chaplain, as well as the Zyla, or God, uh, Godman of Dissething Siebschaft, and president of the Oglava tradition of heathenry, which is the pursuit of the heathen religion through the lens of the modern Pennsylvania Deitch culture. We also have with us Eric Thorpe Moscone. He is the co-manager of Heathens Against Hate, as well as a uh, Germanic Anglo-Saxon heathen for over 14 years. And finally, Reverend Brian Weiss, who is an interfaith heathen minister from Bucks County, Pennsylvania in the United States, where he is the administrator for the School of Sacred Ministries, where he teaches on polytheism. So a little bit about us. Heathens Against Hate is an independent branch of the Troth, which is one of the world's largest heathen, inclusive heathens, organi heathen organizations in the world and based in, primarily in the United States. As, what's the best word I can describe it? As a autonomous branch of the Troth, Heathens Against Hate became an advocacy group for the practice of inclusive heathenry as well as combating hate and bigotry within the heathen faith with the use of educational resources, inreach and outreach, um, as well as community initiatives. And I realized that I just used the term heathenry and the heathen faith interchangeably for what, like six, seven times just now? <laughs> so I guess it's good to pretty much start off with what is heathenry. Simply put, heathenry is the polytheistic religion of the Germanic people. That is, the belief in multiple gods that are central to the ancient religion and spiritual life of Germanic antiquity relating to the Germanic people that once occupied central, northern, as well as insular parts of Europe, places like Germany, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, as well as parts of England, Scotland, and Iceland. And in the modern era, is found, commonly found in Pennsylvania Deitch culture, found in the United States, as well as Eastern Canada. Much of what we know of the faith comes from medieval manuscripts, primarily the poetic and prose Edda, written between the 12th and 13th centuries, as well as the sagas, which are historical narratives written between the 9th and 12th. In addition to surviving folklore, archaeological records, such as ancient burials and settlements, provide a glimpse of uh, a glimpse of how people lived back then, as well as evidence that supports some of the folklore and allows us to gain better, gain better insight of these people and what they believe in. Some of the mythological motif that surrounds the heathen faith is centered mostly around Norse mythology that some of you might be familiar with, with well-known figures and gods such as Odin, the god of the one-eyed god of wisdom, war, and death, seen here depicted throughout the centuries. And let of course let us of course not forget Thor, the thundering the thundering 
god of protection, hallowing, and consecration, as well as an agricultural deity and god of the farming, and some might say god of comic books. <laughs> For, for, for those of you unfamiliar with Heathen Reed, that last one was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Heathen Reed is mostly an orthopraxic faith as opposed to orthodoxic, where we value correct practice over correct belief. This is mostly due to the fact that these traditions were once an oral tradition, now lost through word of mouth and interchangeably throughout the, throughout the years and centuries. And so it makes the heathen faith categor categorically a reconstructionist faith, where we delve into the sources that I mentioned and extract from it elements that reconstruct and revive this ancient Germanic faith into a living religion. And just like any other religion, heathenry carries with it its own iconography, sacred symbols that provide adherence with spiritual significance, as well as identifying each other. And while the heathen faith carries with it many symbols, there are a few symbols of note. Mjolnir, or Thor's hammer, originally made of amber, iron, and most, more recently discovered sandstone, this amulet may have been worn about the neck around the same time as Christian conversion, as an answer to the Christian crosses in order to identify adherence of the old faith from the new. And as a symbol of protection and consecration, it is the most well-known and most popularly used symbol representing the heathen faith today. Additionally, there is the Irminsul, or the Great Saxon Pillar, or it's sacred, it was a sacred symbol to the Germanic Saxon people, representing the Axis Mundi, or the center of the world, connecting the heavens and the earth, in the form of a tree or a pillar. It may have been an actual pillar, destroyed by Charlemagne in the year 775. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And it was famously depicted uh, in this 12th century relief in the uh, Existeiner uh, relief in the Tudewald Forest in Germany, where it is a post-crucifixion scene where it is broken or bent under the weight of Nicodemus bringing Christ down from the cross. And finally, the runes, an ancient system of Germanic writing, primarily used for commemorative inscriptions and calendar making, has also most recently also been used as a form of divination and common symbols in tattooing. <laughs> yes, that's my kinsman's arm. <laughs> um, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, symbols provide a special narrative where it connects adherence to the faith by by, by, its sacred, by its sacred meaning. And what essentially happens is, we have to ask ourselves what happens when these symbols take on a different and more sinister meaning. And this begins at the late 1800s with Helena Petrovna Blavatsky and her writings that co-found the Theosophical Society mystical movement inspired by Eastern philosophy and brought over to the West. Note the swastika on the top there, you're going to see that reappear. <clears throat> um, in her monumental work, The Secret Doctrine, written in 1888, Blavatsky mentions that humanity is descended from root races. One of the races mentioned, the Aryan race, descended from the Atlanteans, from, the, from that very famous mythical land. Now, whether she or the Theosophical Society intended it or not, her writings did inspire two contemporaries who were proponents of racialist thought. 
The first was a man by the name of Adolf Josef Lanz, also known as Lanz von Leibenfels, who developed an anti-Semitic and racial theory conceptualizing higher and lower races, where he placed the Aryan race at the highest, which he termed Gottmenschen, or Godmen. The second 18th, is 18th century occultist and novelist Guido von Liszt, who developed the Armanen runes, which were inspired by the ancient runes that we've seen before. However, these were designed and utilized to promote a racial form of spirituality, which these two men called Ariosophy, or Aryan philosophy. This racial, this new racist and racially charged occult movement was the focus of discussion in 1911 of the Thule Society, which was formed self-describing itself as a German study group of Germanic antiquity, and so named after the obscured Greek geographical reference to the land of Thule, the mythical land of where the Aryans came from, supposedly in the North Atlantic. One of the prominent members of this society was a man by the name of Anton Drexler, who disenfranchised by World War I and inspired by the Ariosophical thinking, founded the DAP, or the Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, the German Workers' Party, on January 5th, um, <clears throat> excuse me, on January 5th, 1919. Eight months later, in September of that year, Adolf Hitler joins this party, and in two short years, reforms it to the Nationalsozialist Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, or Nazi Party for short. The party logo was changed, and the Nazi flag we know today officially incorporated in 1921, where now the swastika that once represented a symbol of well-being now represents the pure Aryan race. <coughs> Additionally, in 1932, the Nazi paramilitary group the Schutzstaffel, or the SS, formed. Inspired by Guido von Liszt's Armanen runes, appropriated the rune of the sun, Soilo into their logo and reinterpreted it as victory, or twice victory. But how does that, how does all this relate to the heathen faith today? Excuse me. After World War II, a Danish Nazi sympathizer by the name of Elsa Christensen migrates to Canada in the 1950s before finally settle, settling in Florida in 1969. There she founds the Odinist Fellowship through the publication of her magazine, The Odinist. Her writings were essentially an amalgamation of anti-Semitism and white separatism, along with a combination of psychological concepts, primarily that of Carl Jung, um, of the collective unconsciousness, used as a tool to promote the idea of the racial consciousness of the white race. It is during her time in Florida, though, that she is imprisoned on a drug charge and forwards her mailing list of the Odinist magazine to an ardent follower. That follower was Stephen McNally, shown here on the left. Your left, my left. That left. Um, <laughs> who in 1970 forms the Also True Folk Assembly, a heathen organization. <clears throat> renamed the Also True, the Also True Folk Assembly, so I'm sorry. Free Assembly. Free Assembly. Thank you. <laughs> Originally the Also True Free Assembly, renamed to the Also True Folk Assembly, um, Officially now, this heathen organization is designated by the Southern Poverty Law, Southern Poverty Law Center as a neo felkish hate group, now led by Matt Flavel on the your right. right. <laughs> <laughs> this organization markets the heathen faith as a, quote, ethnic religion of and for those of Germanic European ancestry, as well as advocating for strict 
gender roles, such as masculine women, as masculine men, <laughs> feminine women, excuse me. <laughs> Oi, baby. It's a tasteful thing to say, so he's having a hard time getting through it. Yeah. <laughs> can imagine the research going into this. Um, <laughs> Nobody's shown an axe at your laptop yet. As well as strict heterosexuality. These sexist concepts gave rise to other groups to form and cloak themselves in our heathen beliefs that might be more extreme and sometimes violent, such as Operation Werewolf and the Wolves of Vinland. Self-described as an Odinic wolf cult, this hate organization that is also considered a hate organization by the Southern Poverty Law Center, masks itself with heathen symbology and faith, including popular gym culture, while promoting white supremacy and extreme misogyny. That still continue to appropriate symbols without claiming heathenry as a faith. Most notably, the National Socialist Movement, the largest and loudest hate group in the United States, changing their logo from the ever popular swastika to the more esoteric Othala rune, a rune that often is interpreted or designated for family, heritage, and ancestry. Here's another good example of another rune being appropriated, but as you can see, and as you can imagine, for an already obscure religion trying to rebuild itself, this is a public relations nightmare. And so we strive to save our, our, our religion and our sacred symbols by advocating for their reclaimment. However, it should note that we do not, nor will not, reclaim the swastika. Despite its use in antiquity, in the Western world, this symbol is too blood-soaked to be reclaimed. However, complications do sometimes arise where similar symbols <laughs> have been used independently from and have been developed independently from the Nazi appropriation of the swastika here seen in Pennsylvania Deitch culture where it's used as hex signs. Part of our struggle is trying to separate, and we are forced to come to terms, literally, where we have to draw lines in the sand, and we have folkish heathenry and inclusive heathenry. Folkish from the German Völkisch, of the, of the folk, or of the people. While it may sound benign, it denotes an exclusive membership to a group. And in the heathen context, it determines your association with a group that you must be of Germanic European or aka white ancestry. It's something that Matthias Gardel in his book Gods of the Blood termed the biologization of spirituality, where genetic lineage is a caveat for spiritual access. And you've seen this with the AFA marketing heathenry as an ethnic religion for Germanic people, as well as the Odinist magazine's writings. And then there's inclusive, which is us. Yay! We. We would like you to write this for our magazine. We welcome all who welcome all, regardless of race, ethnicity, physical or mental ability, gender, sexual orientation. We welcome all who hear the call of the gods and wish to participate in our faith. And though much of what you have heard deal with the extremism in, the med in our midst, there are certain aspects and certain actions that have been taken in order to promote this. One of which was Frith Forge, 
which was sponsored by the Trotes International Relations and Exchange Program, which was essentially a conference of heathen delegates from around the world who came together for workshops, lectures, and community worships. And the other problem with extremism is that it's loud. And so that is sometimes the first door that somebody goes through in order to be introduced to heathenry. So much of our effort lay in correcting the public perceptions of people who are not part of heathenry. Thankfully, other organizations who are not even heathen have taken steps to drawing that same line. The Anti-Defamation League has done a terrific job with their hate symbol database, where they specify of judging symbols in context, in context, especially if it's in dual usage. Additionally, Heathens Against Hate has been in constant contact with the Southern Poverty Law Center that has thankfully reworded their neo fetish hate page where they use terms that we use within our own community to distinguish from commonly held beliefs and their extremist variant. And then our parent organization, the Troth, does inreach, provides inreach services within prisons, which are inherently the hotbed of racism, for it's already existing segregation by race. And because of this, a lot of the work that's being done is to provide inmates with academic resources, such as books and, and, and literature, as well as chaplaincy services. And in addition to the prison system, these services are also available in mental health facilities. And Heathens Against Hate, where we have programs that are designated to bring heathens together to discuss matters within their local region that offer a way for heathens to come together and discuss with us, tell us, hey, what's going on in our specific area? What do you need help with? Do you need resources? What are some of the problems that you face? Is there some extremism in your local vicinity? How can we rectify that? And additionally, uh, we promote heathen businesses, heathen-owned businesses, and encourage them to donate a proceed of their of their profits to nonprofit humanitarian organizations such as the SBLC, the ACLU, um, and the Anti-Defamation League, to name a few. Um, <clears throat> In summation, I'm going to read this because my memory is shot to hell. <laughs> Extremism exists in every religion. In the heathen faith, it exists in the form of racism and white supremacy. And our battle against it wages on two fronts. We battle within our faith by attempting to educate and reform those who have accepted the false notion that genetic lineage should be a caveat for spiritual access that one must be of Germanic European ancestry in order to honor the gods. We battle outside of our faith by reclaiming our sacred symbols that have been appropriated by hate groups. As you rise up to defend our heathen faith from exploitation and advocate for their proper, for proper public perception of our commonly held beliefs. However, despite our anger and frustrations brought about by these divisive acts, we must understand the underlying reasons behind them. The need for inclusion, for our voice, for uniqueness and identity, all of which are legitimate to the social human condition. Equipped with this knowledge, we can approach these issues with compassion and showcase heathenry and its myriad of customs and practices as inclusive and self-empowering without the toxic hubris bred by exclusion. Where we are reminded by, where we remind ourselves and proclaim to all that we are a religion of community where we stand by our words and our deeds which are held to the standards of fate and universal law. With them we honor the gods and our ancestors, both of our blood and beyond our blood. But more importantly, we honor each other by welcoming all who welcome all. 
Thank you. I'll open the panel for any questions that you may have, and I will do my best to choose nice and fairly. Yes, ma'am. Do you have any um, online resources um, that people can access, especially in terms of like Facebook groups that should be avoided um, because they seem to be like there's a myriad of them out there and um, <laughs> Facebook, like any online platform, is extremely prolific in saying whatever you want because you're behind a, behind a screen. And so it's very difficult to try and filter unless you go to a Facebook group and you see that they have a specific statement that says that we welcome everyone and that, we, and that we're inclusive, and using that term inclusive in their descriptions or whatnot. Um, there are a few inclusive organizations that we have actually on our website um, that are not necessarily uh, um, Facebook groups but there are groups that have um, especially internationally have also participated in Frith boards which I mentioned earlier um, as well as those that have through their statement or through their bylaws which are publicly available have stated their inclusive intent and 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 promoting that uh, idea when it comes to online I would recommend uh, I would recommend Asking or even emailing moderators and seeing what their what they what responses you may receive in return. And quite honestly, seven. very often people will come once the heat is against hate group and say, "Does anyone?" Stand up and go to the mic, please. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they only gave us one. <laughs> and um, quite honestly, sometimes that's. Uh, what happens is people come on to the Heathens Against Hate group and then they're asking us what we know about this group or that group. So sometimes our own fora can serve as a, um, a touching point so you can find out more about particular groups. Now sometimes a, a group just pops up that we've never heard of before. Um, oh yeah, I'll get that. And um, there's also, uh, Ethan touched upon this in, uh, in his presentation, there's this movement called Declaration 127, which was started in Hugens Hedenhoff, which uh, I am a moderator for, as are a couple other people who are at this, uh, this event today. Uh, Declaration 127 comes from the words of the holy, uh, what most of us consider holy, words of the Havamal, uh, verse 127, where if you see it evil, you need to speak out against it. And um, any organization that's signed to that has a has, that's the expression of their inclusive intent. And uh, so you can actually go out to declaration127.com, I believe is their address, and you can see all the organizations that have signed on to that. Just Google declaration127. Yeah. It, might, it might actually be .org. It's declaration, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Google declaration127, declaration127, all one word, oh, actually two words. And uh, it should come up. Any other questions? Okay, before you go, no. um, they may need to know, but two of the things that, that uh, Ethan talked about up there, Frith Forge and Frith Works, could you explain why we use the term Frith? Okay, Frith. I, frith. Well, Frith and there's a, a, a companion word, Grith. And uh, the, two, the two are often used interchangeably, even though they're technically not. Um, Grith is actually the, what, the piece that you extend to somebody when they're in your environment. Like you come together on, on, on a particular subject or topic and you, for that time you're all, you know, all recognizing like the policies of the host group or whatever. And then once that's over, you, you can go back to hostilities. It's, it's like a, it's a temporary truce. That's what Grith, Grith, uh, Grith essentially is. And, um, but Frith is a little bit deeper. Frith is, is the bonds that you have against have with your own community and um, the people that you consider to be the closest to you. And within that, you, many people see that there's also levels of Frith. You know, your, your parents and your children tend to be the ones that you have to attend to the most. If you're forced to make decisions, you tend to go for your closest responsibility and then outward. In, within my tradition of Org Lava, we owe Frith, at least an element of Frith, to everybody simply by being human until they give you a reason not to to uh, invest in their welfare you are to invest in their welfare so and uh search for okay, yeah. okay any other questions
come on, somebody has to have some. <laughs> Or do you have a uh, hierarchy like Christianity? Do we have a hierarchy? A hierarchy? Yeah. Okay, in terms of? Uh, there's no ace in both. Yeah, there's no, there is, this, but you know what? Actually, this is a fantastic one, and I think several of us can speak to this, is, um, it's a fantastic question, actually, is part of the problem is that we have no, we are a very decentralized religion. This is both very good and very bad because the Catholic Church can issue an edict that tells people what to do. But I, as the president of the Troth, I could say, hey, well, for the Troth, this is what we're gonna be doing along with the board of directors and stuff, but no other organization is bound to whatever we say. And that's, that's good because it gives us all you know, independence and sovereignty of consciousness, but it's bad because it, Everything's kind of on court. Uh, from that point of view, uh, your religion probably is much closer to Sikh faith because that also is a decentralized faith. Mm -hmm. We do not have any clergy. Um, actually, yeah, we have. We've actually noticed some of the similarities between your, <laughs> your, uh, between your religion and ours. We have. We actually have, and um, it's kind of cool. Right, when, when I use the introduction, uh, take the mic out. We have knives. All I wanted to say was when I teach the introduction to polytheism for the School of Sacred Ministries, which is subtitled Pagans and Heathens and Druids, oh my. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I cover is I go through at least uh, eight or nine different traditions and show where the similarities are. You know, so if there are traditions of hospitality in, in Hinduism and Judaism and what have you, show how they relate into different heathen traditions as well. Okay, uh, so there's actually a book called um, God is Not One, The Eight Religions That Rule the World. Okay, and this book took a look at what are these eight religions and how do they work? What is the question they answer? How do they answer it? And what are the practices they do? And I it laid it out for eight religions. I tried to do the same thing for heathenry then. The idea that, well, what is the problem heathenry addresses? Disconnection. Disconnection from the earth and its cycles, disconnection from each other, all right? What is the solution? Reconnecting. How do you reconnect? In community through doing rituals. Does that sound like any other tradition you know of? Yeah. <laughs> uh, how about the uh, role of uh, women in your... Uh... Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I find that, that, women that, right there. That, that, front, that front row right there is... Um... <laughs> but how come they're not really the family? <laughs> <laughs> I have an answer for that. Um, <laughs> Honestly, at our, we've done this in a similar discussion to this one at uh, Philadelphia Pagan Pride Day. And our panel was a little bit more diverse. However, um, this panel is actually more diverse than it looks because we have people of different de different descents, non-Germanic necessarily, and we also have people of different sexual orientations here. So um, while our panel may look like it's a whole bunch of white guys sitting here talking. Um, there's actually more diversity at play. Um, however, short answer, she's too busy with everything else. She's too busy with everything else. She's doing all sorts of things and she uh, and she and I keep each other busy. So, um, uh, and, 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 in, in defense of the front row here, he is the current president of the Toth. She is a former president of the Troth mm -hmm. and run the one running our clergy program. Yeah. I have served on the board of the Troth and more offices than I care to name. She is a former she is a former board member of the Troth. She is a current serving board member of the Troth. Yeah. We're and letting I, them talk because we want to let the young bucks have an hour. <laughs> <laughs> we are here to without them. Yep. Yeah, they say that about secretaries. Too. Oh, no, 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 I'm secretary here. Um, and the other thing is, right, uh, part of it is also because, you know, Eric and I have been running Heathens Against Hate for a few years. And then we've already been on before. And 
one of the dangers, and this is something that I was specific about with, with the vice president of the Troth, who is an African-American woman, and she's been involved in community for the that. longest time, her name is Gary Farmer, that we wanted her to be on the panel because of her unique experiences as an African-American woman in heathenry. But the big, the big trap there that we have to be careful of is tokenism, is purposely just putting somebody up because they happen to be African American, or because they happen to be gay, or whatever, and you know, and I was clear with Gary, like, I want you up here because you got you have experience, not and she's like, well, I know that, but but not everybody else does. Um, virtue signaling, where you purposely you know say things in order to look good, you, you pay lip service to things, and tokenism are serious problems, um, and they are forms of racism in their in, or bigotry in their own right. Well, we have yeah, so I think, can we also speak a little bit to um, heathenry in general and how women play a role within heathenry? Can they hold um, clergy status or... Um, <laughs> Would you like me to answer yeah, that? She can answer the clergy question. This is Diana Pax in our clergy court. Yay! Yay! Yes. <laughs> Uh, I've been active in the Troth since 1992, and uh, which I think makes us one of the more longer-lived heathen organizations, if not the, really continuously, because the the AF, the first Asatru Free Assembly, uh, imploded in the uh, mid 80s and uh, then reconstituted as the Asatru Folk Assembly in a much more racial line. And uh, when it originally the AF, and I know this isn't your question, but I remember these things. Uh, the AFA originally was the Asatru Free Assembly, and everybody from the neo-Nazis to the old Norwegians used to go to their events, which made them quite exciting sometimes. Uh, when it imploded, the uh, Asatru Alliance, an organization of groups, which later added a we are for white people thing to their constitution, uh, was started. And the Troth, which was an organization of individuals and has always been intentionally inclusive of everybody who feels called by our gods, uh, was um, founded in 1987. Uh, we have always had a clergy training program, uh, and <laughs> it has representation of both women, men, people of all uh, genders and affiliate uh, orientations. Um, we currently have a very good group of trainees, uh, of whom he is one. Now, are you counting yourself in the program these days? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there's another one. Hi. There's another one. So. Um, I'm, in fact, very excited about the people that we have in training right now. Uh, and we are trying to figure out what it means to be heathen clergy. Uh, what is our role? How is it alike? Uh, the role of a minister from any other faith. And one of the reasons it's so good to be here, because we're meeting with leaders from many different uh, faith traditions and trying to see how everybody else does it. So. We're kind of feeling our way forward uh, in this extremely interesting times we are living in. Do you have a uh, written, uh, you know, religious scripture like Bible or Torah? Or uh, or uh, 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 hold on, there was a question over here first. I, I want to hear more about, because I know a friend does it as well, your prison uh, outreach ministry works. I think that is your... That's, right. That's Rob. That's <laughs> Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Is to have people realize there's more to heathenry than the, the folk oldism that's kind of become part of it. Let's get one. This is one of my babies within the troth. Um, and it's not the most pleasant topic, I'll be honest with you. Um, and Lisa right here, is, she's also a fellow chaplain and in, in reach leader along with me. And um, both of us have... Uh, different sets of experiences. Most of her, hers are in California and most of mine are in New Jersey or Delaware. Um, and uh, 
what happened was for me is as I had, we had a member of the Troth who was in, in New Jersey prison and a whole, like I used to send up Yule cards. Yule is one of our, high, our holiday of the winter solstice and the beginning of the new spiritual year. And I said, sent the cards off to everybody who was in my territory. I was a steward for New Jersey at the time. And it took the guy a whole 10 months to write back to me. And he wrote back saying, what I've been wanting to write to, I've started writing several times, but I keep, would keep throwing the letter away because I, I was so embarrassed about my, my situation here. And so he and I started writing back and forth, and, I, and, um, and he was telling me some of the challenges that they were seeing in the prison, that every time he tried to learn something about the Germanic faith, he kept being handed things by, you know, Aryan Brotherhood and all these other groups, um, and, uh, and he was very frustrated by it. So I decided that I would come, come down and see him, and uh, it took a little bit of working, I and mean, there's a lot of challenges to for many heathens, I think in Lisa's case, and she can speak to it if she wants, is uh, that her Wiccan background was actually probably more able to get in the door now. Yep. Okay, well, for us, within New Jersey, it was easier for Wiccans to get in than it was for heathens, and because they were a well-known religion already, people had at least heard of them. Um, but for me, getting in there was a little bit of a challenge, but once I was in, then all of a sudden, all the chaplains all the chaplains in the area wanted me to come in and do the chaplaincy work. I'm like, well, I only have so many hours in a day, you know. But for, it, it, was, it was very interesting going in there because people, a lot of them were, we had recruiters coming in from the, folk, uh, from, from the racist organizations. They would come in and it was, unfortunately, it was almost like a, one of those bug zapper kinds of thing, you know. The, uh, the event was the bug zapper, and anybody who came to that event, they would, the, the, the recruiters now knew that they were at least interested in Germanic, um, in Germanic religion, so then they would start to approach them you know, outside of my events. And um, I started having inmates tell me who the recruiters were, and then I would tell the chaplains. Um, and uh, so, it, but it, it was very frustrating for me because it, it, it really, you're trying to get a certain message across, and you have these infiltrators coming in. So we started kicking them back out. But there is a sizable segment of the heathen prison population and the prisons that I worked in who really were earnest about what they wanted. They really did want to learn. And um, I remember talking to somebody who was kind of on the borderline with his um, with racism, and I said, "Well, you know, what is that doing for you? Like, what?" What, how is this racist belief serving you? And he said, well, it gives me a sense of community. I'm like, yeah, but your community is in here now. Like, you, whatever you were doing before is not working for you if you keep ending up in prison. Like, you, know, you need to break the cycle somewhere along the way. And then when they get out, there's, this, there's insufficient supports for them, and they oftentimes end up falling right back into the same communities. I had one inmate tell me, and he's like, hey, he got, I got out. I was having trouble finding a job, I was having trouble keeping a job, and you know, I ended up running into one of my old buddies, and then the whole thing just went down the pike. And then I had another one who actually went up to New York and got his, not, his swastika tattoo and his back removed, so, I mean, so I mean, and, and actually took on a whole new way of living. So it, it, it can be very successful, but it is highly challenging because for some reason, all these racist organizations are so well funded. There is so much money and so much literature coming into these prisons. I don't even know how they're getting through some of them. Because um, we try to give a book and we try to send our books. If, if I order one of our books offline, I have to have it sent to me first. I have to open the package. I have to put an invoice from us specifically in there. It can't be from Create Space or Amazon or it has to be from us. And then I send it in, and then they check through our stuff very, pretty severely. I'm like, how's this other stuff getting in here? And it usually boils down to there's some questionable, yeah, but there's smuggling, smuggling in there, and there's also some corrections officers who are. Yeah. Um, it is four o'clock. Um, we were told that we were told nothing else is in this room afterward. You can talk to me afterward.
Yeah, so we have a booth in the exhibition hall, 411, and any one of us is going to usually be there that can answer a lot of great <laughs> general meeting questions, even the people that are in there now. Um, I started going into the prison in 2005, and it's because of interfaith, y'all. It's because the Muslim chaplain, who was a part of our interfaith council that I was participating in, asked me for about five years. And then one day, because I was Wiccan, he knew. And one day he said, do you know this God named Odin? Do you know anyone who worships Odin? And I said, okay, now I'll come in. Because he says, I'm worried that they're all racist. And I said, they probably are. Let me come talk to them. So I just wanted to share that about interfaith. These guys are doing amazing work. And education is something that all of us who are at risk have to know so that we can point it out and say, no, that's not who we are. Lastly, I really want to I really want to thank all of you. I had no idea what kind of a turnout that we would be receiving. I was keeping my fingers crossed that I that that, that we could all come here and, and fill up a room. And you guys like you guys helped out with that. And I just wanted to say, going back to that first question about you know trying to find out what groups you should avoid or not. If you join uh, us on Facebook, if you go to our we have a page on Facebook. We also have a group. If you go to the group on Facebook page, you're you're welcome to ask us any questions, and we will definitely answer them. You have, have to answer questions first. Yeah, yes, if you have to questions. yes, we have screening questions to keep the the bad people out. So, <laughs> <laughs> so make sure you answer those. I know there is some concern about whether or not people can see them or not. Hopefully, look for them. Answer the screening questions. If you answer all three, you're going to or message the moderators. Yes, or message the moderators if you're not seeing the questions, and we'll get the questions to you. And yes, do not hesitate to you know voice your concerns. If, tell us what these groups are doing, what kind of terminology they're using, and we will let you know. Yep, that's a racist. Or not. No, they're all right. <laughs> Those questions are the only door door keep, gatekeeping we do, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> After that, it's all inclusive. All right. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you.